corporations who use a two-party dictatorship to restrict our choice of candidates, to turn our elections into auction blocks, and to put taboos on all kinds of subjects that we should be discussing, like a, a speculation tax on Wall Street. Why do you pay a sales tax in Wisconsin? Do you have a sales tax? What is it? 5%? Okay, you go and buy furniture, clothing, whatever. It's probably not on food, right? Okay, but <clears throat> a lot of necessities of life, <clears throat> you pay 5%. Tomorrow, someone can buy $100 million of Exxon derivatives in Wall Street, pay nothing, no sales tax. England has a sales tax on stock transactions. Japan has it. We had it in the Civil War. Very few stocks traded, but helped pay for the, the northern part of the Civil War. In 1905, a, a stock transfer tax passed in New York State. And since the 1980s, because of the power of Wall Street, it's rebated every day electronically. $16 billion. The state deficit is $10 billion. So people in New York State are paying 7 8% sales tax. They don't have a clue that these guys in Wall Street, who are rich beyond the dreams of creases, are paying no sales tax. And the most speculative, we're not talking, you know, solid blue chip bonds and stocks. These are these elaborate, obscure, pyramid type derivatives, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, etc. Trillions of dollars change hands. Like last year, $680 trillion, like that computer trade. Just a tiny fraction of 1% will produce several hundred billion dollars. Taboo. Press doesn't want to touch it. We campaigned on it all over the country. Taboo. So make a list of taboos, of things that aren't discussable. Do we discuss? the horrific way drug policies implemented in this country and Mexico? Taboo! Not discussed by the Republican Democrat. Do we discuss growing industrial hemp in America? Since it's legal to import it from Canada, Romania, France, China. How come we don't allow farmers to grow it? Really? Will it really camouflage areas of marijuana growing? You think a, a marijuana farmer wants an industrial hemp farm nearby to cross-pollinate it with one-third of one percent THC? This is medievalism by the DEA. Taboo. This could be a major crop, <clears throat> including for energy. Single-payer health care. Taboo. Democrats and Republicans took it off the table. Obama invited the head of Aetna, who made tens of millions of dollars last year, Six times to the White House, didn't invite Dr. Quentin Young, his early friend and mentor on health insurance back in Chicago, and the leader of the Physicians for a National Health Plan, once to the White House. Now, I, I submit that our political leaders, to paraphrase Jimmy Carter, are not as caring, not as honest, not as full of common sense, and not as prescient as the average American public. With all its, you know, differences and, you know, ideas and disagreements. That is, if you had a national referendum on these major issues, they would come out much more sensibly than what we're seeing now in Congress, because Congress is controlled by the few who control the many. So it comes down to this university, other universities. This university is more advanced, and I'm told, in uh, sustainable practices, recycling, things like that. It had the first environmental ethics course in 1971, Professor Calicott, in the country. But a lot of universities uh, are exactly the opposite of what the students should be learning in terms of sustainability. They waste electricity, they waste water, they don't recycle enough. Uh, 
they bring fast food uh, stores, you know, uh, restaurants onto campus. They don't have efficient shower heads, uh, etc. Now, what if every university had a political science course called Congress Monitoring 101? <laughs> There's a college and a university, or more than one, in every congressional district. Sometimes they have six, ten, fifteen. Try the Boston area. The students would go to this course, and their job would be to study and evaluate their two senators and their representative. They would, they would analyze the voting records, performance in committees, campaign contributions, constituent service, whether the members of Congress have an agenda to empower the people, which is the top priority, and to inform the people so that the people can exercise their sovereignty in an informed manner, whether they open up access to the courts, whether they open up access to government agencies, whether they allow the referendum recall initiative, whether they clean up <coughs> campaign corruption, different kinds of public financing and public campaigns could be voluntary in terms of contributing on the tax form. Now just think, you got 2,000 universities and colleges, all of them have a Congress monitoring 101, maybe 102, maybe graduate courses. Do you have any idea the impact that would have on the members, the 535 members of Congress? That's all there are. That's the most powerful branch of government. That's the government that's supposed to declare war and gives it to the president. That's the branch of government that is the taxing power, the spending power. You turn Congress around, you change the executive and judiciary. What are we doing back home? Well, there's the NRA, there's pro-abortion, anti-abortion, there's animal rights, but by and large, there is no organization dealing with the general interest in this country in redirecting our nation along safer, more healthful, more economic, and more prescient directions. Now think how easy it is to turn it around. Should you have a course that studies Congress, of course, 22% of your income goes through Congress. If someone said to you, hey, your neighbor, your neighbor spends 22% of your income, your neighbor can raise your taxes, your neighbor can allow others to pollute your air, would you take any interest in your neighbor? Of course you would. That's your neighbor. So, Point one, should students study Congress? Yes. Should they study contemporary Congress, not just historical? Yes. Should they actually study what's going on while they have the course, month by month, week by week, bill by bill, campaign contribution by campaign contribution? Of course. Any intelligent curriculum would want to connect the production of knowledge with a sense of contemporary reality so it can be fact-absorbed and evaluated according to various democratic, accountable principles. Will it cost more money to have these courses? No. It doesn't cost a new building. You don't have to do lab. You know, you're not doing the DNA of your senator. It doesn't cost more money. Will professors like to teach it? My impression is they would love to teach it. Anything to keep the students awake in class. <laughs> will you get a reaction from your members of Congress? You will be astounded by the reaction. They will look at you as the most important people in their political career because you would have a knowledge base that you can disseminate throughout the entire electorate and now easier than ever through the internet. So you, you begin to learn how the production of knowledge in a systematic way in your brain with your fellow students, with your 
thesis, your papers, your seminars, creates ipso facto political power, even if you don't have a dollar to contribute to their campaigns. Why? Corporations have a lot of dollars. They don't have any votes, not yet anyway. We have the vote. So when you look around in the country and you say, didn't John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s write out an essay to his grandchildren where he said that modern productive economies have reached a point where they can solve the economic problem. The economic problem meaning the abolition of poverty, meaning a standard of living as part of the status of you living in this country. We have more important things, more important pursuits of happiness, more important uses of our time than crawling day after day, trying to eke out standards of living so we can have our residual community wealth siphoned into the rich and powerful's coffers. By having these kinds of classes and courses, we cease growing up corporate. I mentioned how easy it is to figure out whether you grow up corporate or not. Who defines human beauty in our country? Is it defined as a person's character, as a person's personality, as what a person does in terms of healthfulness and kindness and quick aid in emergency? Isn't that a thing of human beauty? That's not the definition. The definition is body shape and skin deep, the cosmetic and fashion industries. And they internalize those standards of beauty so we look at each other and react negatively or positively.